So good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this webinar. I know more people will be joining uh, a bit later, but I think we can already get started with the program. My name is Tina Müller, and I'm the moderator of today's session. This is the third and at the same time, the last of a series of workshops we have convened together with OCHA, the UN Global Compact, and the Global Compact Local Networks in Poland and Ukraine. If you missed the previous two sessions that focused on the humanitarian coordination structures and mechanisms in Poland and Ukraine respectively, you can find the materials, including the recordings on the Connecting Business Initiative website. Next slide, please. So I work for the OCHA UNDP-led Connecting Business Initiative. Our team supports private sector networks around the world in preparing for responding to and recovering from crisis. Our hope is to have the private sector fully integrated into national and international coordination mechanisms and have businesses, even local SMEs, play a role in disaster management. Before I get started and go over the agenda, um, I would like to go over some housekeeping items. So please select the language channel at the bottom menu that you are most comfortable with. All presentations will be in English, but we have Polish and Ukrainian interpretation available. Please submit questions through the Q&A box and leave the chat for general introductions and comments if you would like to share any experiences, that would be great. Also, a question that we get often is whether the presentation materials will be shared after the webinar and the answer is yes. So we will share the PowerPoint and the recording with everyone after the session, and they will also be uploaded on the CBI website. But here is the agenda for today. I will soon turn it over to Sebastian Rodstempa, who is the Deputy Humanitarian Coordinator in Ukraine. He will tell us about the humanitarian principles and how their application or implementation looks like in Ukraine. As he will need to jump off um, the call a bit earlier, we will take questions for him right after his presentation. Then we will hear from Rachel Marr, who is the AAP uh, focal point at the Interagency Standing Committee. Um, she will talk about the topic of accountability to affected people. Next, we will then turn our attention to another important topic, prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, or PSEA. Tina Tinde, the interagency PSEA coordinator for Ukraine, will explain what that means in practice and how it also applies to businesses. Last but not least, Karim El Bayar, who is the CBI program coordinator, will do a quick recap of the takeaway points before we make time for questions and answers. Next slide, please. So before I give the floor to Sebastian, I would like to offer a starting point or a framing for today's conversation. The do no harm approach is really the cornerstone of everything we do. In very simple terms, it means that we, humanitarians, development organizations, the private sector, everyone, should not make the situation worse by providing assistance. Even though the do no harm approach was introduced decades ago, and it's very widely accepted by organizations, even in the context of humanitarian response, many struggle with practical implementation. Sometimes the operational context or some of the challenges, for example, relating to protection are so complex that they make it very difficult um, for even the most experienced humanitarians to fulfill. And the question may not be about preventing, but rather trying to minimize harm. Our speakers today will talk about these challenges, but also the, the principles, the frameworks, and the tools that can help decision making. Lastly, you may also have heard of conflict sensitivity. Um, in fact, it emerged from do no harm, and it relates to an organization's ability to understand both the context in which it operates and the interaction between its intervention and the context, um, with the goal being to minimize any negative and maximize positive impacts, particularly on the so-called conflict dynamics. 
But now without further ado, Sebastian, uh, please take us to the world of the humanitarian principles. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Tina, and, and thank you all very much for this opportunity. My name is Sebastian Red Stamper. I'm the UN Deputy Humanitarian Coordinator in Ukraine. I arrived in Ukraine on the 28th of February. I've been in and out once or twice to support other missions, but otherwise I'm based here in the Dnipro. Uh, and let me start by expressing appreciation to the Global Compact for co-hosting this event. And I'd like to thank all of the participants for taking the time to join us today. I know everybody's very busy, um, but I do think that these sessions are, are really important. Across the globe, as we've seen in Ukraine, the people and communities who are directly affected by crisis, including the local private sector, are very often amongst the first to respond. Affected people and organizations, including businesses, possess the knowledge, the skills, the resources which can support the humanitarian response and improve the overall effectiveness of aid delivery. Thus, critical through forums like this, we have a better understanding of each other and how we work. Now, before I launch into the humanitarian principles, let's just have a quick look at what the current situation is. Each day, 120 of the war, 15.7 million people need humanitarian aid, about 40% of all the folks in the country. With recent movements back to some parts of the country, about over 4.9 million people are refugees, and more than 7 million people are internally displaced. So what are we doing about it? Well, the government's doing a great deal, civil society's doing a great deal, private enterprises are doing a great deal. But speaking for the UN and its partners, we have managed to provide life-saving humanitarian aid to 8.8 .8 million people in Ukraine. And that's, for instance, 6.7 million receiving food and livelihood, more than 2.7 accessing health services and supplies, 1.7 million people reaching cash, receiving cash assistance, which is often one of our preferred modalities for delivery. But it's not enough. We're deploying additional staff across the country. We've got about 1,400 UN staff on the ground at the moment and moving supplies to people we need in need. Currently, I'm looking at convoys uh, to a particular part of the contact line that's looking a bit shaky. So we're providing urgent humanitarian aid to Kramatorsk, Bakhmut, Slovyansk, and elsewhere. And before we lost access to Sviarovodansk, we had substantial deliveries there. We're also trying our best to work in non-government controlled areas, uh, but there are huge challenges in Luganska, Donetska, and uh, Zabritska, and Kherskonska. We have a fairly large IDP response on the go, providing um, food uh, and non-food items to people who are in transit and reception centres, and then longer-term support to longer-term facilities, um, where which will repair. Uh, and winterization. Um, we're very, very conscious that it's going to be a cold winter and we need to get ready for it. So why am I speaking to you today? Well, um, my present day focuses on the presentation focus on humanitarian principles, which provide the foundation for humanitarian action and are quite often misunderstood. Humanitarian activities are guided by four humanitarian principles chiefly, and they are humanitarian, uh, humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. And they are central to establishing and maintaining access to affected people, whether in a natural disaster or in an armed conflict such as this. And I also intend to touch briefly on the sphere standards. Um, for this brief presentation, I'll, I'll draw on a post by the International Committee of the Red Cross for Crescent Society's Director General, who wrote specifically about Ukraine very well. Um, so the Ukraine context, what's going on here has brought forward discussions on humanitarian organizations and their neutrality in Ukraine. Isn't it clear who will support? Is it not clear that there is a clear victim in this awful conflict? Well, there may be, but that's not why humanitarians adhere to the humanitarian principles. They serve a different purpose for a different reason. And while many humanitarians believe they're well understood by all, the reality is they're not. Uh, and in the next 15, 20 minutes, I'd like to explain why they are the bedrock of what we do. So let's start with the basic premise. It's very simple. The purpose of humanitarian action is to prevent and alleviate human suffering wherever it may be found. Simple enough concept. The reality, I'm afraid to say, is quite different. Particularly in armed conflicts, meeting needs can become extremely challenging as conflicts come hand in hand with high levels of mistrust, division, violence, all of which can hinder humanitarian action. Next slide, please. Uh, no, back one, please. Apologies. 
you jumped a bit there, not to worry. Um, so in 1965, drawing on more than a century of experience, the International Red Cross and Crescent Movement developed an ethical and operational framework to guide and enable its work, notably in highly po polarized situations, i.e. wars. There were seven fundamental principles of that movement, and the first four principles, humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence, have come to embody international humanitarian action. These are central to the work of OCHA uh, and other humanitarian organizations. And you can see there, they are enshrined in two UN General Assembly resolutions to which we adhere that are our central um, being, if you like. And at 46.182, which talks about humanity, neutrality, and impartiality, and resolution 48.114, which talks about independence. Next slide, please. Now, the principles are hierarchically organized. And there are two things. They offer an ethical and an operational framework. And impartiality are substantive principles provide moral purpose, if you like. Human action aims to prevent alleviate suffering, humanity, and is driven to needs irrespective of nationality, race, religious belief, class, or political opinions, and that's impartiality. Neutrality and independence are and moral values. Are the very practical tools for securing violence by creating and protecting a humanitarian space. And a humanitarian space is the space in which we can safely operate, or indeed in which people can safely access assistance while the conflict may rage. Those last two are devised or at least acceptance of all neutrality. Demands to take sides and independent means independence means determining needs and operational decisions autonomously, irrespective of any other considerations. Importantly, these principles rely on the assumption that even war has its limits and that the belligerent forces would allow for the provision of principled humanitarian assistance in a safe and unimpeded way, as long as humanitarians in return avoid interfering in like, the dynamics of the conflict. That is not always the case, but that is what it should be. Now, since the adoption of the humanitarian principles, there's been a near constant debate and discussion on their relevance and applicability and the extent to which one can truly be a principled humanitarian actor. Um, and the relation exists between the simplicity of the humanitarian principles and the difficulties actually associated with their application as beyond the skew. What is described to you? when that meets contact with a conflict situation, it can become very, very complicated quickly. The is rarely driven through by needs. There may be access constraints, there may be security considerations, it may be about funding. So an organization's ability to provide support also depends on its ability to strike a balance between competing priorities, needs, and perceptions in order to preserve trust and acceptance. Now, of all of these things, the principle of neutrality is the one which people question the most. How can anyone not take sides in the face of suffering and injustice? How can anybody provide support to people who sympathize with the enemy? How can anyone speak to the side of the conflict where there is a clear belligerent and a clear victim? And some acts um, are sometimes perceived um, as basically not understanding the situation a failure of moral judgment, um, a detachment in the face of suffering, rather than a tool to enable action on behalf of objectives. The reality is that organizations do take sides. We take sides very firmly. We take sides, we take the side of the victims. Speaking with parties to a conflict does not mean supporting them. And in fact, neutrality doesn't mean we need to be silenced. Um, humanitarians can and have public condemned action. Here, for instance, the hospitals, the civilians, and so on and so forth, without compromising our neutrality. But the decision to speak out must be weighed against consideration and acceptance. For instance, um, I were today to speak out heavily about a particular instance or a particular incident, I may then lose access to those people I seek to serve. There needs to be a balance, and I need to work very hard to strike that balance with the rest of the community. Uh, 
humanitarian communities a set of humanitarian principles doesn't mean it's the only acceptable way of working. There could be complement approaches. Some organizations preserve humanitarian access to meet the needs of the most vulnerable. Others focus on, uh, focus on strengthening respect for human rights, like the Office for the High Commissioner of Human Rights. There are organizations working here today that are openly supportive of one party to the conflict. They may not have access uh, to work across the front. They communities living on the territory under the control of the side that they support. Uh, Sebastian, Sebastian I'm, I'm so sorry for interrupting. The sound quality is, is really bad now and it's, it's getting increasingly impossible to hear what you're saying. Um, would it be possible for you to just quick try redialing. I don't know if that will make a difference. Um, I'm just worried that the participants are not able to hear what you're saying. Yes, of course. I'll dial in again. Thank you. And apologies, everyone. Um, we'll just take a quick break and, and let um, Sebastian redial. Hopefully the sound quality will be better when he does. In the meantime, um, I do encourage you to submit questions um, through the Q&A box already about the humanitarian principles. You've seen um, a, a couple of slides and hopefully you've been able to capture some of what he, uh, he was saying. Um, I think he was making really interesting points about, for example, not um, you know, the humanitarian principles usually being interpreted as humanitarians not taking sides, but in fact, humanitarians always take the side of the victims. Um, he was also saying that neutrality doesn't mean that we need to be silent. Um, so I think very Im important and interesting points what he's making, and, and he's really grounding the principles on the realities in Ukraine. Um, so apologies again for the sound quality. I'm hoping that um, it will be fixed now. I see Sebastian, you're back. Would you like to give it a shot and try? Hopefully it works. I, I really hope so. We don't have any problems with connectivity. Here. How am I coming through? Um, not perfect, but let's try. I am sorry. If it doesn't work, please stop me um, and I'll try once more. Um, if, if I may, what I was saying is that um, I think you just summarized rather well for me, Tina, but if I may, there's also the reality that there are organizations here that are openly supportive of a party to the conflict and they may not be able to work across front lines, but they may have better access to communities on the territory under the control of the side that they support. There are a multiplicity of different approaches. Development actors are driven by yet another set of ambitions. Each of these different approaches have their place and they fulfill a specific function. None of them are perfect, nor do they work at all times. But what we can do is just it is misunderstood. And if I may, a practical application of the humanitarian principles Neutrality and impartiality um, essentially were central in guaranteeing access to the Azov style steelworks in Mariupol, where between the 29th of April and the 8th of May, uh, the United Nations and the International Committee of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, managed to evacuate more than 600 civilians from the plant and from some of the surrounding areas. I led the first part of the UN mission um, and my shield, if you like, my, uh, my raison d'etre and my ability to be there was significantly enabled by adherence to the humanitarian principles and simple uh, reality that I was perceived um, as being uh, neutral uh, and independent of whatever else was going on at that time. Just to sound check quickly, Tina, am I coming through okay? It's much better than uh, the first time around. So yes, thank you. Okay. I'm going to leave the humanitarian principles there and I'm going to briefly talk about the sphere standards. 
Next slide, please. A completely different body of work, uh, in many ways, no less useful. Um, the Sphere movement was started in 1997 by a group of humanitarian professionals aiming to improve the quality of humanitarian work during disaster response. And with this goal in mind, they framed a humanitarian charter and they identified a set of humanitarian standards to be implied in humanitarian response. Now, initially, these were developed by NGOs, non-governmental organizations, along with the Red Cross and the present movement. Uh, and they've become a primary reference international NGOs, volunteers, UN agencies, governments, donors, the private sector, and many others. And today, it's a worldwide community which brings together and empowers practitioners to improve the quality and accountability of humanitarian assistance. The cornerstone of the work is the Humanitarian Charter, it's essentially a statement of established legal rights and obligations and of shared beliefs and commitments of all humanitarian agencies, connecting the set of common principles, rights and duties. Founded on the principle of humanity and the humanitarian imperative, these include the right to life with dignity, the right to receive assistance and the right to protection and security. But the Charter also emphasizes the importance of accountability to affected communities, which Rachel will discuss next, and the standards and articulation of what this is. If you go online, you'll find the Sphere's fla flagship publication, the Sphere Handbook. It's one of the most widely known and internationally recognized set of universal minimum standards in humanitarian response. It aims to include the quality of humanitarian response, and it provides usual, uh, uh, universal standards in four core areas, which is wash, water, supply, sanitation, and hygiene, food security and nutrition, uh, shelter, uh, non-food items, and in health. Uh, and I say yes, you can go online. Uh, Thank you, Sebastian. Um, and apologies again for the sound quality. It was kind of getting worse again um, towards the end. Um, I know Sebastian needs to leave um, soon. So I would encourage people to ask questions. You can raise your hand or type it in the Q&A box. If the sound quality is bad from Sebastian's side, um, I'm sure we can even type the responses. I think it would be great to, to, to take a few questions to clarify because um, also because of the sound quality. Um, but this was really fantastic. I think really the, the point is that we're trying to ensure access to the affected people. We're trying hence to also improve the overall quality of the response. Um, these are critical things. Um, I wanted to ask you, as we wait for, for questions, Sebastian, I wanted to ask you, because you also mentioned that this is not always easy. And unfortunately, humanitarian organizations sometimes need to prioritize um, one or more of the principles to be able to gain access and provide assistance to people in need. And, and for example, sometimes access is only author, authorized to um, a part of the population, or it's tied to certain conditions. But, but as you also explained, you know, the compromising on the principles is also bad. It's bad reputationally, but um, even more so because it reduces um, or can reduce access to people and so on. So what do you do in such situations when you are forced to prioritize? How do you proceed? What do you do? as humanitarians? It's a very interesting question, Tina. Um, and I would say balance is imperative in, in everything that we do. Firstly, I don't think any humanitarian worth his or her salt takes no for an answer. If we are denied access to a vulnerable population, then the principles still apply. We will still, still we will be more strident in our attempts to gain access. Now, where um, that is in turn again refused, then we will uh, raise and elevate the issue. 
So for instance, at the moment, we have real problems accessing some of the affected population in the non-governmental controlled areas, uh, Lugansk, Donetsk, and so on and so forth. We have been refused on a number of occasions access to those locations, but that doesn't mean um, that we will, we will stop trying to secure access um, and we will negotiate at the high, highest levels to do that. In doing that, um, we are adhering to the principles we hold here, but also saying, look, um, we're not a part of this conflict, we're not a threat to you, we simply want to provide aid to those people who require our help, um, and the principles are a central part of our argument. We, we require, wrong, we rely on the understanding of all parties to the conflict, where we're coming from, it, it underpins everything that we do. Um, I suppose in, in the long term, if we are denied access um, and, and there is no improvement on that move, then we have to look for the next population in need until we can gain access to that principal population in which who we were trying to serve. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, I see there are no questions in the Q&A box, so I'm gonna actually uh, give you another one. Um, this is particularly because I know the sound quality wasn't so great, and I'm not sure if the audience was able to capture everything you said. So neutrality and impartiality are sometimes interpreted in, in different ways in practice, and, and they're sometimes also confused with one another. So to be really clear, what is the main difference when we're talking about neutrality and impartiality? Well, I mean, everything is open to interpretation, but as, as I said, they're, they're quite different. Um, impartiality is there to provide a uh, moral compass. It's there to drive our operations. It means that what we do is driven solely by needs, irrespective of nationality, race, religious belief, class, or political opinions. Um, independence is, um, oh, sorry, neutrality or independence, you were asking? Neutrality, but feel free to also clarify independence. Neutrality, again, is, 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 is not, it, it, it's basically about not taking sides. One is about um, providing need based solely or providing assistance based solely on needs. The other is about not taking sides in the um, delivery of that assistance. Um, it essentially um, is an operational tool um, whereby we can guarantee access to the population we serve. The first drives our operations, the second drives the way we do them, but they're quite different. Perfect, that was very clear. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick check. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can also raise your hand um, and we can unmute you or alternatively, as mentioned, you can type in the question in the Q&A box. Last call for, for Sebastian before he needs to jump off. I don't think I'm trying to scroll through the attendee list. I don't see any hands up. So I think um, it's clear despite the sound quality. Um, as Karim mentioned in the chat, we will share um, the presentation and, and the um, and, and uh, Sebastian's uh, main kind of talking points. So, so you will be able to check also afterwards if you have any questions. Um, maybe in the interest of time, Sebastian, we will thank you um, and we hope you will be safe uh, and, and take care. Thank you so much for taking the time to join this webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Apologies for the sound quality. Goodbye, colleagues. No worries. Nora, could we please go to the next slide, please? Great. So um, now I'd like to give the floor to Rachel Marr, um, who is going to talk about accountability to affected people or AAP. Um, Rachel, please go ahead and let's hope that the sound quality now works. Indeed. Thanks so much, Tina. <clears throat> Just checking you can hear me okay. And if you want, I can turn on the video or we can leave it off just to be sure. 
Uh, it sounds perfect. No problems at all. So maybe I'll just turn it on so you can um, you can interact a little bit with me as well. So yeah, it's fantastic to be here with all of you as part of this discussion on humanitarian principles and uh, with Connecting Business Initiative. As Tina has said, I'm Rachel Marr. I work with OCHA and the Interagency Standing Committee here in Geneva. Um, I was recently in Ukraine and I'll be returning again. So it's a real thrill to be able to talk to you. Um, and I will emphasize, I hope we do have a bit of an interactive discussion today um, and look forward to hearing your questions and comments after this presentation. I made this a relatively short presentation in that hope. Um, and also in the hope that it will assist us with gaining a common understanding of what accountability to affected people is. Um, I think Sebastian gave a fantastic overview, um, despite the sound, of where uh, the humanitarian principles emerge from. Um, and I'm going to touch on this very specific area of, uh, of responsibility called AAP. So this can be a slightly misunderstood concept. And unfortunately, like many parts of the humanitarian system, and I'm sure you've encountered this, we have an acronym that doesn't really help us out. Um, we love acronyms in this system and this sector. Um, so first straight up a definition about AAP. So it's the active commitment of humanitarians to use power responsibly by taking account of and being held to account by the very same people that we endeavor to protect and assist and that's affected people. In this case, we're talking about Ukrainians affected by the war and related crises. Um, and of course, we have the same responsibilities to those in need who are experiencing other conflicts, um, natural disasters, displacement, and so on. So I think next we need to acknowledge, as, as Sebastian touched on, that this there has been a huge sort of shift over the years in terms of the reform agenda, the humanitarian reforms that have um, emerged, and accountability to affected people has emerged as one of them over the past couple of decades. Um, it's important I think to acknowledge this because it's a kind of essential shift from some of the historical roots of humanitarian action that centered more upon us and uh, us as humanitarians coming in to help people um, and them those people who are vulnerable or helpless who need us so really it's been recognized through those reform agendas that this really reinforces a power imbalance so the shift we're seeing over, particularly over recent years, but over the past couple of decades is towards recognizing that we as humanitarians with resources and with power um, come in uh, to protect, assist and make decisions about people's lives and therefore we must be held to account. Um, so just as you might be expected to be held to account if you deliver a product or a service that is substandard, you promised something to a customer that did not turn up or was not delivered um, or a service that was provided but not requested. Um, exactly the same sort of principle that we, we need to be accountable to affected people. Historically, we've, we've probably reported more to, um, to donors and to ourselves and we're really re uh, turning that focus on, on our accountability to affected people. It's important to also understand who they are. Um, and we often mean people who are the first responders in a crisis, Sebastian touched on this. Local communities, organizations and networks are also for first responders. And often there's an intersection between affected people and the, the sort of organizations that represent them and are, that are trying to help to reach communities who urgently need aid and assistance. So international organizations, of course, respond quickly to and usually intended to boost those local, those local systems. And I'll come back to this shortly, um, but also bringing experience and good practice from the global contexts and similar crises. Although noting very clearly that every, every crisis, every disaster and every context differs vastly and we should not um, simply cut and paste our, our systems. Well, our, our, our responses. So a note on that then this idea of who affected people are right now we already work with many ukrainian colleagues who are themselves affected people so they're struggling with the impacts of the crisis um, are internally displaced or refugees in neighboring countries and of course along with those who are most vulnerable and sheltering in places of open conflict but on the on the former and our colleagues this is a real opportunity to demonstrate what being accountable actually involves in terms of the inclusion and participation of affected people 
in, in the way we design responses and in the way that we implement them and evaluate them. Um, often in many crisis contexts, affected people are just not so visible or um, understood, not as connected or close to um, humanitarian agencies, both international and national. So this is why I, I said and I mentioned and I reiterate that context really does matter in, in disaster response. So in, in operational responses where humanitarian principles are increasingly challenged as, as Sebastian was discussing around the question of neutrality and, and how primary that is to our work, but how difficult it is in terms of accessing communities sometimes, um, it's important we not only prioritize accountability to affected people, but understand the differing experiences of differently affected people based on gender, they need for protection and other diverse factors. So this, we work closely with other areas of uh, humanitarian action and we'll hear shortly from Tina about protection from se sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, but these reinforce the principled foundation of humanitarian responses that really empowers the people that we're trying to help and work with. And this is essential to um, ensuring that humanitarian action is humane, that it protects and restores human dignity and that it remains relevant and effective and that it leaves no one behind and does no harm. So I know we've touched on some of those themes already. So if we look at the next slide, let's look at how we do this in practice. So diving into the basics, our accountability to people is underpinned by community engagement. And you can see that in this slide here. It may seem like a no brainer, but if we don't engage with and listen to and communicate with and understand and know communities, we can surely not be accountable to them. And as I said, it sounds simple, but often overlooked or blurred by the need to rapidly respond with life-saving aid and assistance. And so sometimes we rush in and we don't engage properly with communities, um, not through any, any false uh, intentions. What we know from experience is that when we do um, engage with communities and we do ensure that they're part of the response, it's usually more effective, um, especially in the longer term, because also we consider the legacy that we leave when we come in, um, especially from the international um, community and try to help. So if we look at the diagram under the community engagement piece, you see as humanitarian workers, we must provide information to people about humanitarian agencies activities in local languages via accessible and preferred channels of communication and in a timely way. So this includes raising awareness about um, sexual exploitation and abuse and other um, breaches of our accountability by providing information and the opportunity for complaints and feedback to affected people. And really we, we commit to explaining our obligations and what it means to have um, safe and accessible aid provided, um, and also what it means to make a complaint and how to do that. So secondly, we ensure programmatic decisions are informed by the active engagement with affected communities. So this means listening to feedback, it doesn't just mean collecting, but listening to it as well. Um, and then thirdly, that affected people and communities can assess us and comment on our performance, include um, their complaints if needed in general or sensitive on general or sensitive issues such as um, SEA that we've uh, that I've mentioned and that we, we're going to be talking about shortly. Essentially people re really need to be able to tell us when we get it wrong um, and a simple analogy is again customer service. If you listen and improve um, the product and delivery based on feedback again you're going to have a more effective and accountable system in place. So as humanitarians, we need to change course and direction based on what uh, the feedback is um, or, or a complaint if needed. And you see there in the diagram that this leads to corrective action. So it's really up to us to coordinate amongst ourselves and ensure that what we're doing is what people need us to do. So again, it's not, it should be something of a no brainer, but there, there are so many mitigating circumstances that make, make this a complex operating environment that we really need to actually pay attention to this. So yeah, the, the emphasis then that I wanna to turn to now is on doing this in a coordinated and coherent way. You see a multitude of actors coming in to any crisis response. Um, they all have their own um, funding and mandates often, and it's really important for affected people to be 
you know, the, for their experience to come at the centre of the response. So looking at um, how we do this with a collective approach within the humanitarian systems is what I'd like to, to touch on next. So um, over to the next slide, please. Um, lots of words here, but I'll, I'll step through it. So a collective approach ensures that a set of common services are in place for affected people bringing together humanitarian responders, local and national organizations and the agencies and the government um, to undertake these critical activities within any crisis response. So again, I spoke about coordination. This is absolutely critical in terms of bringing together local and international humanitarian actors to work in partnership and deliver a coherent and principled accountable response. And we owe it to, to affected people to really coordinate amongst ourselves. And this takes quite a you know, quite a lot of commitment and effort, especially, you know, the, it's the, the raison d'etre of, um, of, of OCHA as well to do that. In Ukraine at the moment, we're seeing and have seen over the past few months, the urgent scaling up of programs. And that includes taking communications with communities, for example, um, with a lot of individual hotlines being um, established, producing key information and messages for people on the move um, and, Here's an example of this. This example is to highlight the, the need for coordination um, because it's essential to build trust and to avoid duplication or confusion, um, to avoid sharing conflicting or potentially harmful information with communities, um, and, and to ensure that co coordinated interagency and intersector approaches um, ensure we respond and work together with affected people and with the government and national organizations to support their efforts to do the same. So dwelling a little bit on coordination, it's really, it's really our obligation to make sure that affected people, people affected by crisis actually experience us in a, in a positive way. To do that, we establish two-way communications. Um, and so that's about providing information about the situation and existing services using, as I said before, relevant, accessible and preferred channels of communication, but also in the Ukrainian response, particularly safe platforms uh, in which to establish two-way communications with communities. And we know the, the potential um, threats that the digital communications environment can present. Uh, thirdly, uh, gathering and analyzing the views, feedback and perceptions of affected people is important in order to give evidence to the, the sort of establishment of a system whereby that their needs are met, their views are heard, and we course correct in terms of the response and referring back to the diagram I showed you earlier. Then we close the feedback loop, and this means advocating for their needs um, and the changes that communities seek, but also informing them as to how decisions have been made. So it's about transparency, um, and including as well when decisions have not been made or do not directly respond to what they've requested. It means explaining why decisions are made and um, this requires that, that community engagement that I spoke about earlier. And then finally, capacity building initiatives for affected people and the organizations that represent them, humanitarian partners in the government, other local and national actors. It's all part of a sustainability planning and partnerships, uh, sort of system building exercise and ensures our systems support people as they recover from crisis as well. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll just look at one of the tools we've developed for this, one of the sort of global standards that we're actually testing at the moment. So in the next slide, um, you'll see this collective AAP framework. Can we, can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so as a humanitarian system, we've agreed that we need to do more in terms of these commitments that I've been describing and to really bring them into action. And as such, the wider humanitarian community came together to develop this framework. You can see here a sort of reference wheel that links to its five outcomes. It's essentially a tool designed to enable the leadership, the humanitarian coordinators and the humanitarian country teams to make practical plans and ensure that programming is responsive to people's needs and feedback. So you can see there with the objective, it's to improve the quality, accountability and effectiveness of humanitarian responses in support of local and national systems to deliver a more responsive and people-centered humanitarian action. 
This has been agreed at the global level. We're really testing this tool at the local um, level in, in various contexts um, in terms of testing these, these, these five outcomes and related actions that aim to seek out, hear, and act upon the voices and priorities of affected communities at every stage of the humanitarian response. So that's from assessment and planning to resourcing, uh, to implementing, and of course, during operational reviews and evaluations. Of, of our response efforts. We need to really engage with communities and hear their feedback. So this, this tool is, is designed to be adapted to any context. We're using it, as I said, to work in different contexts at the moment, but really to work with the humanitarian leadership teams to come up with those plans on accountability that seek out communities' inputs at all stages of the response. So over to the next and final slide. Um, before I wrap up, just sharing some examples here of localized systems where uh, they used to gather feedback and analyze trends and package that information for decision-making forums and for decision makers. So this is why we focus on, on leadership and with accountability, it's really a leadership issue. So these, come, these, these examples come from our teams around the world and they represent feedback uh, sort of bulletins, um, community dashboards and complaints response dashboards and so on. So we do have some good practice to bring um, and to learn from. You can see they are, well, perhaps you can't see, but I can show you their coordinated approaches to AAP. They come from Indonesia, Myanmar, Cox's Bazaar and Afghanistan. There are others as well. Um, but they're examples of collective feedback pulled together from different sources, collated in a way that provides information for decision makers on acute issues, needs of communities, perceptions about how well we're doing, um, and how we need to change to meet their needs better. So of course, uh, accountability is more than ensuring we gather feedback. It's what we do, how we respond as a result of it, but it's also how we conduct ourselves when we um, undertake humanitarian action. What happens next from feedback is key. I've just underlined that. So it's critical for us to have mechanisms in place to ensure that feedback reaches decision-making levels and we're working very hard to improve those kind of systems. So I'll conclude there, um, perhaps with a sort of question for you or a call to action, perhaps a request for your own thoughts on how you see uh, you know, your role as operators or as a sector in terms of contributing to this and how we collaborate going forward on, on some of those initiatives. Thanks, Tina, and back to you. Many thanks, Rachel. It's, it's quite interesting how sometimes a seemingly simple concept can actually be rather challenging to understand and particularly implement. But your definition of using power responsibly, I think, really made it clear. It's very helpful, like that's what we're actually talking about. Um, maybe during Q&A, you can also share some more kind of concrete examples of what's being done in Ukraine. Um, but since we're running a little behind um, schedule, I would like to now turn it over to Tina, and, and maybe we can go to the next slide. So the last concept of today's webinar is going to be presented by Tina Tinde. Um, Tina, please walk us through what this whole concept of prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, what it means and how it looks like and how it can be applied um, to the work of the private sector. Hi, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. And also thank you to, to Tina and to the two previous speakers for outlining, outlining so well uh, the principles and the practices that, uh, that are basis for, for the niche where I, where I work. So uh, we can move to the, to the first page of my presentation. Uh, that's not the first page. Um, it's, well, it's fine to have that one. Uh, thank you so much. We can, I'll just like to before I start on the procurement clause, you feel free to read it. Um, I would like to uh, to um, to say how much I feel for everyone who who suffers the consequences of war in your country, and uh, it's very impressive how people, businesses, authorities, and civil society in Ukraine have stepped up to assist victims and to adapt your activities uh, to a new and challenging reality. 
This is my second time to, to work in beautiful Ukraine. I was election observer in Cherkasy during two months in 2015. And I fell for your, your people and your country uh, and your handicraft and souvenirs. Uh, last week uh, I arrived in Lviv and um, I will work here for six months or more. Uh, and I will also move on to Kiev probably to be based there, but I will travel uh, around the country. Uh, my job is to coordinate efforts of uh, national and international entities to prevent and respond to sexual exploitation and abuse of people who seek uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, and uh, the abuse in this niche that I am working on would be committed by those who are tasked to assist. Uh, helpers abusing those they are meant to help sounds like a contradiction of terms, uh, and it is, but it happens. Uh, and it happens more often than we know, because uh, on a global level, uh, around 80% of survivors of gender-based violence do not report the acts. There are many reasons for this, which we, we cannot go into all of them now. Uh, um, but I will, we, we will have a chance to discuss in the, in the chat afterwards. So aid workers, uh, whether they are from an international organization, from civil society, private companies, or government entities, they are expected to show the highest standards of behavior. We have job contracts, we have staff rules and codes of conduct and procurement uh, regulations, as we will get into, that everyone must sign in order to be taken on. Uh, abuse of power is a no-no. Aid workers meet people who might be destitute or who have lost family members who have health issues, such as a disability after attacks or disasters, a chronic illness, or they have lost their homes, their jobs, maybe access to school or studies, or they may have lost the support of their family and the community around them. Media have covered how some aid workers take advantage of their position, distributing assistance or recruiting staff to demand sex uh, from particularly women and children under 18 years of age. Most of the perpetrators are men, uh, but there are examples of women who take advantage of vulnerable groups as, as well. In two 2016, um, a woman from my country, Norway, she was in her 50s, and she worked at an emergency center for asylum seekers. Uh, and she demanded sex in return for helping a male Syrian refugee who was 22 years old. That's actually the age of my son. Uh, with job applications and money for clothes and trips. She offered him a room at her house where she lived with her husband and she cajoled the young man to have sex with her when her husband was not at home. The refugee and other male asylum seekers told journalists and they showed text messages that proved that several female employees and volunteers at emergency shelters for refugees had uh, propositioned them. I feel sick to my stomach uh, when I read about such exploitation, no matter who commits it. And preventing, uh, we, we all have to work uh, together uh, with the business community to prevent violence against women and children, marginalized groups such as gay or transgender people or people with disabilities or ethnic groups, minorities such as the Roma who are here in, in Ukraine also. And now there is a large influx of international aid workers uh, in Ukraine uh, that is also causing an uh, additional uh, challenge. But, and even though I am, I am a feminist myself, but I'm not bringing uh, feminism to Ukraine, of course, I'm quite aware. Um, we can all learn from the Ukrainian writer, feminist activist and polyglot, Natalia Kobrinska. She was born in 1851 in Belulia. And uh, she was quite, uh, quite um, an active woman uh, who has, um, who has uh, been teaching uh, generations of um, inspired and taught generations of Ukrainians and international communities about, um, about the need for an equal world and where women and, and men have, and people of other identities have the same value. So I'm, I'm moving over to the, to the slide that you see, that is a stamp that the UN has issued. Um, over the last year, there's been a lot of attention to preventing this type of abuse and exploitation committed by aid workers. Um, there is um, in each procurement uh, agreement that the UN and partner organizations make with the private sector, there is a, there is a clause about businesses having to respect the same standards and have the same practices 
as, uh, as the UN and international organizations themselves. Uh, because these, these um, acts, they violate universally recognized legal norms uh, and they are extremely harmful to, to people. Uh, they can ruin their health and some people even lose their lives because of sexual exploitation and abuse. So, um, so if we would really like to work more with the private sector in, in Ukraine, uh, you have a lot of skills, you have, um, you have um, uh, logistical uh, networks around the country, you have a highly qualified workforce. Uh, Ukraine is famous not only for your agricultural production, you're also famous for your uh, expertise on IT uh, and technology and many, many, many other areas. And we do recruit uh, often from the same talent base. Um, so uh, basically what I'm saying is that we are in this together, uh, protecting uh, those who are vulnerable because of the, uh, the escalation of the conflict now in February and anybody else who is suffering from uh, increased poverty and displacement uh, in Ukraine and the neighboring countries. Next slide, please. Um, and we, uh, the prohibitions um, are quite clear. They're not, per perhaps not all of them are, are quite known uh, because the prohibitions um, that we and you uh, as business people have to, have to respect if you are working with us, it is not necessarily linked to national law, but it is, um, it is um, a code for those who wish to work in the humanitarian or development assistance. The prohibition is obviously no sexual activity with anybody under the age, age of 18. That is the definition of a child as by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which Ukraine has signed and the neighbor countries. And there should be no exchange of money, employment, goods or promises uh, for sexual activities. And there should be no uh, exploitation uh, or degrading sexual uh, uh, activity that would be, um, that would uh, undermine the, um, the dignity of the person. You see here, there is a poster from Haiti, it's from 2020. And perhaps you have read about how um, sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment at the workplace was, um, was uh, exposed by the media in 2018. Next um, slide, please. So the UN expects all its supplier to take the appropriate measures to prohibit uh, employees. And if we look at this poster, it's in Ukrainian. Uh, it has been prepared for this, uh, this uh, situation that the country is in now. Uh, it's very important that, um, that local people are aware of the prohibitions because there's a lot of bluffing going on. Um, Aid workers uh, may have been recruited very quickly. Uh, they may be volunteers. They may actually have come from other countries or from other parts of the country where they have committed sexual exploitation and abuse. And due to a very quick recruitment and not enough time perhaps to check their police records or to check uh, with the HR where they worked before, they may actually be, uh, be prone to, to, to taking advantage of their role. So this list here, it's, it's a very good, um, very good poster. It says that there should be, there should be no, um, uh, nobody should pay or, or provide any services for humanitarian assistance. Uh, there should be no uh, sex with, uh, with children under 18. Um, there should be no uh, sex for work, that it has actually been a recruitment method, unfortunately, by some uh, aid workers uh, to demand sexual services from, from people that they recruit. Um, and there should be no bribes, clearly. Um, and also it is prohibited to buy sexual services. So buying sex um, here in Ukraine, it's illegal by the country. Um, by the country's laws, and it is also completely prohibited uh, for any, any aid worker. Um, and um, so this is something that we have to work on, uh, work on together. Next slide, please. Uh, in, in terms of the partnerships, which go a little bit further than being a supplier, um, the partners um, such as um, civil society in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, local organizations, uh, the Ukraine Red Cross, uh, they are working together with the UN and with the International Federation of the, um, of the Red Cross to develop practices uh, around leadership and policy, human resources systems. I mentioned the, the need to, be, to, uh, to carry out safe recruitments and training, awareness raising about the prohibitions. 
uh, and also provide um, the possibility to report internally. Um, victims, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps 80% of victims do not uh, report, but there are many reasons why they do not report. And maybe they do not know where to report. Um, maybe, they, um, maybe they know already that uh, the assistance in the local community is perhaps has been destroyed by, uh, by the conflict or that they were not of high quality or that they did not provide the necessary confidentiality, for instance. So the need to, for organizations and partners to know where there is assistance um, that can be referred to for people who have been exposed to, to gender-based violence, uh, that is very important for the partners to know. There has to be a capacity to investigate in a sensitive, professional manner uh, into uh, sexual misconduct. This is a big uh, challenge for uh, countries and for um, aid actors alike. Um, and there has to be a disciplinary process. Uh, perhaps you can also relate to the, the disciplinary process very often comes quite um, at, the, at the forefront. Um, so we go, we go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, the, 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 the need to build awareness and trust in the local communities, it's absolutely crucial uh, so, um, so that they feel comfortable to report. And you can move to the next slide. Uh, in, in some instances, uh, reporting to the journalists have actually been the reporting method of choice by some uh, by women, for instance, in the Congo, they, uh, they told reporters that they did not feel comfortable reporting to the organizations that were employing their abusers. We could make a, a connection perhaps to, to churches where there has been uh, child abuse and where um, reports have been buried uh, internally and where perpetrators have not been held to account. So there is, there is this um, mistrust among, uh, among people of uh, reporting to entities that they do not know uh, that maybe have mechanisms that are in languages that they do not know and that are new in the country. So, so for us, um, uh, as Rachel uh, mentioned, we do need to work very closely with, um, with Ukrainian people and Ukrainian uh, authorities and civil society in order to build trust for people to feel comfortable to report. Next, please. Uh, in terms of uh, the business community, I know that um, many of you, if not all, you have um, quickly had to adapt to new ways of working and even new, new, new products. Uh, many of you have had people who had to, in your company, in senior positions and other positions who had to leave the country. Uh, and I congratulate you on the flexibility and the, the dedication that you, that you have shown. Many of you have also started humanitarian operations on your own. It's always the local people who start the first. And of course, private businesses would be very, very much needed and involved in that. So I urge you to, to, to look particularly at hiring now the many displaced women in Ukraine and in the region uh, for your companies. Uh, there is an initiative supported by the UN Population Fund, which is here, about breaking the, the cycle of unemployment. So this is one way that you could perhaps contact them. They are on the website. Thank you. Next one, please. So next slide. I want to make one example of um, traditional private partners of the UN um, that are the private security companies. Uh, security is extremely important. UN and partners, uh, they go to areas that uh, may be experiencing a conflict or that have experienced a disaster. And uh, actually gender-based violence increases um, during, uh, during times of crisis. Um, and there have been also scandals around private security companies, such as uh, Dincor in Bosnia, where uh, it was involved in trafficking women from Eastern Europe into um, to be to be serving international staff in Bosnia. So there is a, a movie that I recommend, which is called The Whistleblower, about this. Um, there is a very good initiative from that I will uh, speak about on the next uh, next slides, which is by the International Code of Conduct Association, which saw this as a, saw it as a need to increase the the sensitivity, the gender sensitivity of private security companies. And also to they have developed to go to the next please. they have developed um, a, a PSCA um, a policy which can uh, which can help private security um, abide by the standards 
and in that way actually get contracts. Because obviously these, these security companies would like to work with the UN and with, the, uh, with other aid or, uh, organizations. And now the demands are very strong on every partner having uh, not just the principles in place, but also the practice. You, this is a poster in Polish we have made. And here is, um, you can go to the next. And this, uh, this is the International Code of Conduct Association. I'm not sure if any of you listening now work for private security companies, but you probably have a friend or you know somebody in Ukraine who does that. So I urge you to, to, um, to recommend to them to look into to this organization and to join them and they have trainings and tools. And the next, please. Uh, and I mentioned the survivor-centered approach. This is an extremely important aspect of um, prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. It is to not only focus on the code of conduct <clears throat> and the trainings and the disciplinary action internally, it is actually, <clears throat> it has to do with the survivor or the victim, we could say also, and how they are treated. Um, so we need to, to make sure that we use the approach, which is number one, safety, confidentiality, respect, non-discrimination, informed consent, and also child protection matters are extremely important. So I would urge all of you to, um, to, to follow up if you like. You could, for instance, uh, contact your local Red Cross branch and ask for a conversations on, on these matters. Um, sexual exploitation and abuse also covers harassment. Um, and many people uh, would like to discuss and learn more about uh, prevention of sexual harassment in the, in the workplace. Because it is quite common. Unfortunately, many, particularly young women, feel in, um, insecure at their own workplace. And this is not just happening um, in, um, in the aid sector. It also happens in the private sector, as you know. So this is, uh, uh, as you know, also from the Me Too campaign. So this is something where we can definitely put our forces together. And I'm available if anybody would like to contact me uh, to discuss how we can, uh, if you would like to have a discussion in your company or to receive any guidance. Uh, and we are translating into Ukrainian as fast as we can with the Translators Without Borders, which are now called um, Clear Global. We are, we are quite busy working on the, the gender sensitive aspects of this, uh, this activity in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Tina. Um, also for the e examples that always really help in understanding what are we talking about and why this topic also is so important. Um, next slide, please. We have now covered the, the principles and the concepts that we wanted to introduce in this webinar. We understand that it can seem like a lot of details. So our colleague Karim Elbayar will now have the very difficult task of summarizing the key takeaway points um, that we would like you to at least remember or walk away with today. Karim, the floor is yours. Well, hello colleagues and thank you, Tina. Thank you to all of the previous speakers as well. Um, for this really interesting presentation and a, and a big thank you to everybody who stayed with us while we had our technical difficulties early on. It's one of the costs, of course, of trying to bring in Sebastian from Ukraine. Um, next slide, please, Nara. So I, I actually don't think that my task is quite as difficult as all that. You know, there's really four major points that we've heard today that we really do need to consider. And I think the task for all of us who are coming, coming at this from a slightly different angle, who, you know, the people on the line, most of you are not full-time humanitarian workers, but you're full-time business owners or business um, or, or people who are involved in the private sector, people who are working and also want to contribute to help the people of Ukraine. And so I think that the natural sort of response is to say, well, I'm just gonna do something and that something is going to be a, a good thing. But what we've heard today is that when the private sector gets engaged, whether it's it's a one-off sort of donation of goods or services or a very substantive and long-term engagement, which is something we've seen in Ukraine, a, a number of big businesses, national and international, setting up their own housing, setting up their own distribution centers and making long-term commitments. When businesses get involved in humanitarian response, 
which is a good thing and something that we welcome and encourage, we do have to keep these principles uh, in mind. And I think it's a, an interesting opportunity for those of you who are coming from businesses to really get exposed to, to these ideas, the ideas that govern humanitarian response, uh, the principles that we comply with, and to try to adopt them yourselves in your operations. So the, the four really big points that we talked about today, of course, the first, do no harm, making sure that your actions are not making the situation worse. I have been part of humanitarian responses in other countries around the world, in refugee situations, for example, where we have inadvertently made things worse by not considering the social, political, and economic dynamics at play. It's something that we really have to consider carefully. There is additional guidance on this point, but when we get involved in a humanitarian situation, we have to make sure that we don't inadvertently make a mistake. In my own personal experience in a very different context in a country in the Middle East, I was part of a humanitarian response where we were providing major services for a refugee community that was in a place, a host community that didn't have access to those services. And that dynamic became toxic very quickly. We needed to make sure that what we were doing benefited both the refugee community and the host community. Those are the kinds of things that you need to think about, but there's there's a lot more involved in Do No Harm as we, we were briefly exposed to, and we can talk more about that. Sebastian walked us through the humanitarian principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. I think in this situation with the Ukraine invasion, it's extraordinarily difficult to meet these principles sometimes. It really is. And I think many of the people on the line here have been personally affected by what is happening. And it's hard to maintain your neutrality and impartiality. I think, though, that the point we'd like to make is that when businesses are engaging here, in order to guarantee that we as a humanitarian community writ large can continue to have access to the populations who are most in need, we do have to make an effort to maintain our neutrality, to maintain our impartiality, our independence and our humanity, and really to think about having a serious firewall, to put a, a fine point on it, a serious firewall between humanitarian response and what is happening with the military, the military engagement. And we've already seen some incidences where that, that red line hasn't been quite as clear. And that is a dangerous situation, both for the company that is providing humanitarian assistance and also for the wider humanitarian community, something that we need to consider seriously. Of course, accountability to affected populations. I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about this in the past. I think for business leaders, this should be something natural because a successful business considers what their customers want and need and makes adjustments based on the feedback from their customers. The key point here for us is that if you are engaging in humanitarian response as a company, do you have a mechanism in place to give that type of power to the beneficiary because the beneficiaries of your assistance are not customers and they don't necessarily have the power to go and seek assistance from somewhere else. So when there's that power dynamic at play, are we thinking about it? Are we making sure that we address that power dynamic? Are we making sure that the services provided, the goods provided, the assistance provided is what is needed? It's really important to have those mechanisms in place. And of course, we had a, an excellent presentation from Tina about prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. And this is just, I mean, this is just absolutely essential, absolutely critical. You may think that this doesn't happen in your business. You may think that this doesn't happen in your community. It happens everywhere. It happens within the UN system. And all of us, it is incumbent on us to make sure that we have policies and procedures in place to ensure that affected people can access protection and assistance without fear of exploitation or abuse. It's really important for businesses who are engaged in humanitarian response to consider this particular item very clearly and to think about how to put it into action. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, I just, I'll, I'll make a very brief pitch to say that we have some more detailed guidance notes on these topics on PSEA, on AAP, and on conflict sensitivity and the do no harm principle, all available on our website at connectingbusiness.org. For those of you who are here in this meeting today, if you gave us your email address when you registered for the meeting, you will receive copies of these in your inboxes as well. Um, and I think that the last sort of message I'd like to leave you with today is that our team, the Connecting Business Initiative team, which as was mentioned, is a joint initiative of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and the UN Development Program, we are available 
to help. We want you to think of us as a resource that is a safe place for the business community that is getting involved in humanitarian response and certainly in the unprecedented mobilization of businesses um, related to the, the, the war in Ukraine. Do think of us as a resource. You can, you can drop us a line. You can send us any questions you may have if you are interested in getting more engaged and more coordinated with the UN system. We're happy to do that too. For those of you who weren't with us in the earlier webinar series, we've also done with Global Compact a series of workshops now on how the humanitarian system operates within Ukraine and how it operates within Poland. And we have recordings of those earlier webinars also available on our website. But do connect with us. Um, our website is here. You can also find us by email at connectingbusiness at un.org. We're very happy to see all of you on the line. We're very happy that the private sector is engaged in humanitarian response and recovery. And we hope to facilitate that and to encourage and continue with that going forward. Um, I see, I, I don't wanna talk for too much longer here because I, I'd like to leave a little bit of room for questions and answers. So um, Nara, you can go to the next slide and let me pass it back to Tina to invite our panelists back on the stage to answer any questions or comments we may have. And colleagues, I do encourage you to, to send your questions, send your comments, your reactions to what you've heard today. It, it's, uh, it's more interesting if we have a, a, a discussion together and a back and forth together, you can use the Q&A or raise your hand in the Zoom application. Thank you, Tina. Thanks, Karim. And colleagues, indeed, we still do have a little bit of time for questions and answers. And you can submit your questions through the Q&A box or raise your hand and we will make sure to unmute you. Um, there is already one question that I would like Rachel to answer. Um, if you could explain the difference between AAP or accountability to affected people and participatory approaches. Um, some uh, participants might have heard of participatory approaches. So is one approach more advanced, one more basic, or what's the difference? Thanks, Tina. Um, okay, so accountability to affected people is an umbrella concept. It's, it's essentially a commitment, as I said at the beginning, that we are accountable um, for our actions when we go in with power and resources to give people assistance. Um, within that, and you heard me talk about community engagement, um, there are a lot of different ways that we ensure our accountability or that we promote um, our work so that we are available to communities and we are more available. The participatory approaches um, describes something more, even more advanced. And I would say we're on a spectrum where we really want to reach a point where we don't even have to talk about this. We work with communities because that is the approach we have. But because, as I said at the beginning, we, we, we came in and sort of like we, we came in like we've got the resources we know best. Um, we're now working more with people um, and having continuous community engagement throughout the, the, the sort of program cycle, participatory approaches are about actually that exactly that, working with people, having them participating in uh, the work that we're designing, the way that we're implementing it, um, the way that we resource it and evaluate it, and having the sort of approach where it's like actually communities are participating in this exercise. They're not the recipients only or the beneficiaries. These are words I don't really prefer to use. I, you know, and, and I avoid the word populations when we talk about this, because it is about people. So participatory approaches are, for example, co-designing um, part of the response. And a lot of agencies and organizations already do this. They sit with communities and work out what's going to work best. Um, and they design their programs around that. And then they evaluate them as well around that. What I've focused on is more of how we do that whole of response um, approach. So this, this is, you know, we still have a way to go because it is hard to coordinate around something like that. But they're one way to really ensure that we're more accountable. So it's not an either or, but a participatory approach is a, is a more sort of, I guess, advanced um, way to ensure that we engage communities in a, you know, in a meaningful and a continuous way.
Many thanks, Rachel. Um, I also see that our colleagues from the Global Compact local networks in Poland and Ukraine are on the line, and, and I would definitely invite um, Camille. Um, we, we just, we just um, gave you also the right to speak. Camille, if you want to come in and, and share any thoughts at any point, um, you, you can unmute yourself. Um, or Tatiana, also, I see that you're also on the line, Tatiana, if you want to say hello, if you want to reflect on any of these concepts, please do so at any point. Um, and um, Tatiana, can you, can you hear us? Sorry, yes, sorry. Uh, I had some troubles uh, with the connection. Do you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this very fruitful uh, presentation. Uh, I believe that uh, it's really important uh, for the whole private sector to understand the, the humanitarian principles because many of our companies, uh, which are participants of Global Compact Network in Ukraine, uh, help uh, Ukrainians uh, in different levels, uh, in different measures. Uh, and it's great uh, when they have such a uh, big overview of what's going on and how other businesses uh, all over the world uh, respond to, to this uh, to such kind of crises uh, i believe that our businesses uh, study this uh, unfortunately uh, by heart uh, trying to respond uh, uh, on what's going on in ukraine right now and we see the transformation of this help uh, from very urgent to a long run ones. Uh, actually, we are proud of our businesses which are participating in Global Compact uh, because we, we see uh, how much they do for Ukrainian people in Ukraine and outside Ukraine, or for those who became refugees in different countries. And um, uh, I'm really glad uh, that uh, Notwithstanding, uh, Ukrainian, business, uh, Ukrainian businesses continue to support uh, our local network uh, with uh, different projects like uh, mental health project, uh, where we try to unite uh, professional psychologists and uh, Ukrainians who need psychological support. And uh, as, I, as our first lady said, uh, there are at least 15 million people uh, who uh, need such psychological support. And we try uh, to help uh, as many people as we could with this uh, project. Uh, um, I hope that at the end of uh, this month, we will be able to launch uh, the platform where Ukrainians would be able to see uh, which uh, psychologist uh, they would like to have. Uh, their uh, own psychologist uh, and uh, appoint uh, a consultation uh, which will be free uh, of charge for Ukrainians uh, and they will be able to get uh, uh, very needed psychological support. Uh, so thank you very much once again. Uh, it was helpful and I believe that uh, our businesses will follow uh, your rules and uh, these principles. Thanks, Tatiana. Uh, maybe you can also drop your contact details in the chat box while I believe most companies on the line are already familiar with the local network in Ukraine, but just in case somebody would like to reach out and I would invite Camille to do the same. I know uh, Tina's email was on the slides, but Tina, maybe you can drop yours and Rachel, you as well in the chat box in case anybody would like to um, learn more about the work that you're doing or how the private sector can integrate AAP or PSEA in their own work. Um, I do still want to give Camille the floor in, in case he wants to come in and say hello or reflect on any of the topics that we've discussed today. Camille? Camille, you're 
on mute. I'm not sure maybe you have some challenges with audio. Um, please feel free to come in at any point. Um, we have a few more minutes left. And, and I also, Rachel, actually, I received a direct message on chat asking if you could share um, a, a bit more on the concrete examples of what's being done in Ukraine, um, hotlines for feedback and complaints, questionnaires, and so on. So, so maybe if you can take a couple of minutes to just highlight some, some of the work that has been done in this area in Ukraine specifically. Sure. Actually, there's a lot that's been done, and I, I mean, I would defer to colleagues there to give the absolute latest on it. But I know there's been a lot of work around cash messaging, and you know, really a lot of different agencies are providing cash assistance now and have scaled up cash um, programs. So that's you know, a particular kind of um, direct assistance that we provide um, people in need. But really, we've tried to make sure, again, going back to what I said about the coordination, that those key messages are aligned and that there is one sort of set of messages around all the different agencies that are providing cash. So we've, we've done um, frequently asked questions and, um, and, and key messages around that. Um, I know there's a lot of discussion. I mean, there's a lot of hotlines that are already in existence and we're having a really detailed discussion with our colleagues there. And I think Yulia might be on the line. Um, she could speak to this much better than I could um, around how we unify and, and ensure that people understand which hotlines are for what and that there's a referral system in place between them and that we look at whether or not we need to have one, one system in place to make sure that we don't let anyone fall through the gaps. Um, that said, we're also looking at the, the, um, the national platform for civic assistance, um, DIA, the DIA app that the government operates and whether or not there's a way to sort of boost that or maximise it. And I think some, there's some initiatives already underway to kind of collaborate there. Again, I would defer to the colleagues there to really give the details and I, I prefer not to, you know, give information that's, that's outdated, but I know there's a lot of um, effort underway to really make sure that all those multiple systems that are being set up per program and per agency and per organization um, are really starting to come together with referral and coordination. Yeah. Many thanks, Rachel. We're coming to the end um, of our time here. I'm just going to do a very quick check to make sure there are no questions in the Q&A box um, and also to check if anybody has raised their hand so we don't want to ignore anyone. No, it looks like everything is clear. Um, colleagues, I do want to thank our speakers, um, Sebastian, Rachel, Tina and Kareem. Um, also Tatiana from the Global Compact Local Network in Ukraine, and of course our audience uh, for taking the time today. As this was our last webinar of the series, I really do want to recognize the partners. So um, of course the CBI team, but OCHA, the UN Global Compact, and the Polish and Ukrainian Global Compact Local Networks for a wonderful collaboration around the three webinars. All of them have been recorded and as mentioned, the materials are available. So if you would like to go back to any of the webinars afterwards, um, you can find the material on the CBI website. Um, as we're really short now in time and Karim already summarized the key points of today's webinar, I'll just close the session by just reiterating the importance of principled and coordinated action as it will lead to more effective and sustainable support to those in need and and that of course is what we're all looking for so with that um, i would like to thank everyone take care stay safe and have a good day goodbye <laughs>